Okay, so hi, thanks for joining us uh, today for the first uh, official Rome Center for Responsible Leadership lecture with Dr. Jessica Smith. So um, if you don't know Dr. Smith already, she's an anthropologist who studies the mining and oil and gas industries with a focus on corporate social responsibility, engineering, labor, and gender. She's an associate professor in engineering, design, and society division at the Colorado School of Mines, where she teaches and conducts interdisciplinary research with engineers and applied scientists. Her forthcoming book is called Extracting Accountability, Engineers and Corporate Social Responsibility is under contract with the MIT Press. She's previously the author of Mining Coal and Undermining Gender, Rhythms of Work and Family in the American West, which was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Science Foundation. And literally last week, her third book, Energy and Ethics, was released by Wiley Publishers. So we're very happy to have Dr. Jessica Smith today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. This is actually the second time I've been at Rowan. I was lucky to be here a couple of years ago to work with some of the engineering faculty and their students. Um, so how many of you are studying to be engineers? How many of you know or love an engineer? <laughs> so I'm an anthropologist by training. Um, and then I started working at the Colorado School of Mines back in 2012. Have any of you heard of the Colorado School of Mines? A few? So it's 100% um, engineering and applied science university. Um, you can't get a degree in anything else besides economics. And so I arrived having no experience in engineering. I was trained as an anthropologist pretty all of the way through. And I was fascinated by this place where I found myself and I wanted to know more about it. Um, the, the School of Mines, as you might imagine, has long-standing ties to the mining and petroleum industries. So on my very first career day at the School of Mines, I walked into the kind of big um, area where they were hosting all of the companies. There were like 200 of them. But you had to walk by, you can't really see this, Newmont is the world's largest gold company and they had a gold-plated motorcycle just kind of sitting outside the front doors. Uh, Mines is also unique because we have our own mine up in the Rocky Mountains. It's a teaching and experimental mine where we can do um, science experiments. Students also do safety training. I hosted a conference up there um, for a network of scholars who are anthropologists, historians, sociologists who all study mining in some way. So what I'm going to share with you today is some of my research about engineers and engineering in these industries. Um, as you know, they're highly controversial. Um, most people, when they think about mining and oil and gas, social responsibility probably isn't the first thing that comes to your mind, right? We think of all of these disasters, um, but in my time, Getting to know petroleum engineers, I learned how they were enchanted by ideas of clean energy um, and decarbonizing the economy. I learned about environmental engineers who accepted work in these industries to try to make sure they did environmental performance well. I learned about mining engineers who imagined themselves providing the material foundation for the rest of the world. And so for me, this was an opportunity to think more critically about what are these corporations um, corporations, as you know, exist as legal entities. Um, they're fictional persons. And so they can enter into contracts, they can be sued, um, as BHP was in the wake of the big tailings dam failure in Brazil last year. But they exist as much more than legal entities. And where might we place the conscience of a corporation? Is it in the decision of a mine foreman to shut down production when safety is compromised? Would we find the conscience of a corporation in a CEO's speech, trying to convince people that coal is clean? Or maybe it's in the face of a truck driver who has to make decisions about where she's going to be working. Or maybe it's a group of young interns who end up doing volunteer work, wearing a shirt that says, Anadarko cares. Or maybe we're all the corporation, right? We're shareholders. We're not just old white men as parodied in this cartoon. 
but we're also people who hold mutual funds. We make our own investments in the stock market. So anthropologists argue that instead of looking at corporations as this monolithic entity, as something that is coherent, it is solely driven by profit, that we should be studying corporations as multiply enacted entities. That BHP Billiton doesn't just exist as this fictionalized legal person, but whoever goes out wearing a BHP Billiton polo shirt and answers questions from a community member about the safety of their operations is enacting that company. Every time one of the petroleum engineers I know shows up to a backyard barbecue and gets asked a question about the safety of fracking, they're also enacting a company. And what this does, it allows for showing how the corporation can be enacted to sometimes contradictory ends, right? So there's power struggles inside of corporations. Sometimes there are people who have a very narrow definition of a financial bottom line that they're going to pursue at all costs. And you can have other people who make arguments that good community relations are also good for the financial bottom line. And those people make different sorts of decisions. So I find this to be very productive. Um, this is a theory that comes from anthropologist named Marina Welker, who studied Newmont, actually, in Indonesia. Um, but she argues for paying attention to how corporations are enacted by the people who work for them, instead of just attributing something to a company as a whole. And so for me, this offers a really important and interesting opportunity to re-theorize the role of engineers inside of corporations. Um, so the stereotype of engineers, uh, maybe from some parts of the public, certainly from a lot of social scientists, I think is captured in this mural, um, which I found outside of one of the engineering buildings at a university in Columbia, where I did research. You can see that this person is represented as an engineer because of the hard hat, because of the tools, but they're being portrayed as this puppet that is controlled by a hand that's the same color as gringo money, right? It's green. So, so they're kind of playing up and critiquing the stereotype that engineers don't have agency of their own, kind of that they're just trained to do whatever their manager tells them to do, who does whatever his boss tells them to do, who does whatever shareholders tell them to do. And this is a really reductive and stereotypical understanding of engineers as they actually go about their everyday work. They're not puppets, they're people. They have their own ethical projects, they have their own moral ambitions, and they try to create their own professional spaces that accommodate those values. And so for the last seven years, I've been studying engineers ethnographically. So it started off as a survival project, right? I find myself at the School of Mines. I have no idea who I'm surrounded by, you know, why people think in certain ways. And I ended up building that out into an actual research project to try to understand the perspectives of engineers who work in these industries that are popularly vilified. So my proposal is that by paying attention to engineers, we can learn something important about corporations, about how natural resources come to be. Um, and that by critically engaging engineers, we open up some space to think about transforming industries from the inside instead of just protesting them from the outside. So today I'm going to focus on specifically environmental dimensions of engineers' work and how they imagine their accountability to the public. You can't really see the picture very well. Um, I don't know if we can maybe put like, the lights down a little bit or if that's not possible. It's OK if it's not possible. Um, this is a big open pit gold mine in Guatemala. Um, it came under extreme um, public criticism because of the way it handled its relationship with the indigenous people who lived closest to it. Um, but I think when we think about, yeah, try it. Um, engineers who work in these industries Kind of the first image that comes to our mind is of, oh, thank you. Does that work for the video? Yeah, OK. So we think about stuff like this, right? And, and so when we think about minds that look like this, the question might be, well, what kind of environmental conscious does the person who designed that thing look like, right? And a lot of the people that I worked with, there was a heightened sense of public criticism of their work. Um, so, for example, 
My interviewees talked about people already thinking that they were the enemy. There was someone here who tells people that he's a petroleum engineer, and people give him the stink eye and think that he's an earth raper. Um, this engineer here actually grew up in this town in Colorado called Durango. It is an outdoor mecca. I mean, you can ski there, you can hike there, you can enjoy rivers, you can fish. It's kind of like whatever you want to do. Um, and people are really left-leaning. And his family was too. He described his parents as being hippies. Um, and so he went to the School of Mines. He ended up choosing petroleum engineering. And he came home and was severely condemned by his friends and family for choosing to pursue petroleum engineering, right? So how could you do that? You need to come out and see what this industry is actually doing to our land. So how do engineers themselves understand environmental responsibility in their role as corporate employees? How do they think about and work with the environment? Um, and here I put the environment in scare quotes because in the United States, and especially in engineering, we tend to think about the environment as something separate from us, right? We define the environment as kind of a, a lack of human activity, even though it's human activity that produces the environment. But I just wanted to, to signal that. So I'm going to be using that understanding of the word environment. And more specifically, um, I'm interested in asking the question, in what ways do they understand kind of this environment as more than resources, right? So is it possible to look at a mountain and see more than a deposit of gold? Is it possible to look at eastern Colorado plains and see more than potential oil and gas extraction? And for me, this was really interesting because almost every time I sat down with an engineer, I interviewed about 75 of them for this book from people all the way who were their first year out of college to people who had become CEOs. And it was really hard to find someone who didn't profess some sort of love for the outdoors. Um, so this is not a picture of the petroleum engineer I'm going to talk about, um, but a good illustration of the kind of stuff he likes to do. He's a backcountry skier. Does anybody here do backcountry skiing? Or is that like a Western thing? So backcountry skiing is, is when you're going out in the wilderness, so there's not a nice chairlift that takes you up to the top and you follow a predetermined trail. Backcountry skiing is you hike in, kind of with your own stuff, into national forest land, and then you ski, right? There's no lift lines. There's no other people there. So it's kind of an extreme sport. And so this petroleum engineer and his wife, who is also a petroleum engineer, love backcountry skiing. Um, but they often felt attacked by people who lived um, in the same town where they, where they worked. And so this is part of his interview transcript at, that captured a really common refrain throughout all of my research. What he says, he says, do you know the resources, the things that come out of the extraction process? It's your smart little socks. It's your Patagonia jacket. It's your skis. It's your contact lenses. It's so integrated with society. It's not just the gas in your car. So he's doing something really interesting. And he's showing that oil production is necessary for all of the fancy outdoor environmental equipment that people need to use in order to enjoy the outdoors. So he's kind of portraying the importance of his industry for, for doing this kind of outdoor enjoyment. Um, I met another chemical engineer who spent her career working for BP. But she was also a world-class mountain biker. Um, she had won several national championships. But every time she wore her BP jersey um, cycling, she got flipped off by other cyclists. Um, I think because that community in many parts of it, people consciously bike in order to reduce their consumption of oil. And so the idea that you could have a fellow cyclist who was kind of working for the man was unthinkable and maybe offensive for some of the people that she worked with. But she didn't see a contradiction um, between her love of the outdoor and her corporate work. So there was a very fervent belief in the people that I interviewed that natural resource production could be done in a way that was responsible and respectful of other uses of the land. So this is a quote from another petroleum engineer um, who had grown up in southwestern Colorado. He'd spent his life working on the rigs because his dad did too. Um, 
And the day we went to interview him, he said, well, OK, that sounds good. But if it's a powder day, I'm not going to be there. Uh, because he loved skiing so much. And he ended up quitting kind of earlier his corporate job because it didn't allow him the kind of flexibility that he appreciated. Um, and what I like about this quote um, is he's talking about putting himself in the shoes of outdoor enthusiasts as he's designing and building his oil and gas operations. So what he says is that because he operates in this very special part of the country, it's beautiful, it's public land, right? So it's not just belonging to him or a landowner, it's enjoyed by lots of different people. That he wants everything to look good. And he wants someone who's out there and in the outdoors hiking, because they, they love being outside, to see his operations and not be offended by it. He doesn't want people to think that it's ugly. Um, and for him, being a consultant allows him more control over his work, so he can do his work in ways that meet his own high standards. So these were all examples um, in which engineers had found some harmony between their work and their environmental commitments, whether it was as full-time employees or as consultants. But I also met lots of engineers who struggled kind of with their profession a lot. Um, a lot of them were geological engineers, interestingly, which we could talk about maybe in the Q&A. Um, so this was one of my favorite interviewees. He was older. Um, he would have graduated in the 1970s. And, and he described this kind of bifurcation that happened in his life and detaching. He said that the whole reason he got into geology is because he loved being outside. He grew up in the Midwest, uh, but then he moved west as soon as he could uh, because he enjoyed being in the outdoors and, and hiking and identifying rocks and fossils. But he went to look for jobs, and basically the only jobs that were available were working for these resource companies. And he said, this is just a, a, a great quote. He said, I was always afraid of finding something, right? So as a geologist, he's the person out there trying to look for new deposits, which could become new mines or new oil and gas um, fields. He says, that was because I love the outdoors. I've always been a camper and a hiker. I didn't want to see anything messed up. I would bet that a lot of the geologists, the people that go into this business and find themselves in exploration, have that same regret. They're afraid of actually being successful in the corporate world. They don't want to be successful, right? So because they're in this kind of catch-22 position where your work might be endangering the thing that you love so much. And, and the, he said the way he dealt with it was, quote, you join the Nature Conservancy, and then you go out and look for gold. So kind of you can be an environmentalist in your free time, but then you kind of check out, and then you do your job the rest. Um, some of my other interviewees. They had developed these very thoughtful reflections on their work um, and justifications for their work. So this is a geological engineer um, in his 40s. So he's about mid-career. And similarly, um, he moved out to Colorado because he loved the outdoors so much, pursued geological engineering because that's what he wanted to do professionally. Um, but he said that it's a real conundrum when he and his colleagues get flown out to some potential site. And their job is to try to see if there can be a big mine built there. And all of a sudden, they start thinking that maybe everything that they're seeing, this pristine wilderness, is going to be ruined right, by the very fact that they were successful at their career. Um, so he talks about you know, sitting around these campfires, right, because they're, they're camping, basically and lament about the fact that this beautiful valley is going to be destroyed. And then we talk about, well, how do we justify doing this? And so his metaphor was of steering the ship. And, and so what he does is he starts off by saying, you know, we all need these minerals. Um, so I got here on a plane. Kind of I require all sorts of things for my everyday life. I mean, my phone requires mining. And so. If I'm going to have those things, then I need to be part of the, we say, steering the ship. We got this big ship, and either you can be the green piece who jumps in front of the ship and tries to stop it, and I'm fully supportive of those people, right? So he's not saying that we shouldn't have activism against these industries. But I could choose to be that person who is jumping up and down in front of the giant ship and gets pushed out of the way, or I could help steer the ship. So we say, well, all of us at our firm, we're helping to steer the ship. 
And maybe we're steering the ship off the edge of a cliff, but we're steering the ship. And that's how we justify it, rightly or wrongly. So his idea was that from his position as a consultant who these companies would contract, he would do everything humanly possible to try to make sure that it was done in a responsible way, um, instead of just trying to stop the industry entirely. So I've, I've thought a lot about this, because this idea that we are all dependent on the products of mining and oil and gas production was pervasive throughout my research. I couldn't have a conversation or go to a conference or go to a mine tour in which someone didn't talk about it, that I needed to put a name to it. And so I'm calling it the ethic of material provisioning, because um, it kind of provides this sense of rightness or good um, to their work. And when you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. So these are kind of um, products of this group called the Minerals Education Coalition. They're based in Denver, but they do lots of outreach. And so what they try to do is take things that you use in your everyday life and show where mining comes from it. Um, so here they're taking this um, cute little kid on a bike, and they're showing all of the mining necessary to make the bike. Uh, this is an advertisement from an equipment company at a big mining conference. It shows a woman who's really enjoying her phone. Um, and then they have little pictures of the minerals that are required kind of to make that phone. Um, and you can see the tagline is made possible by mining. Um, this is uh, an image that's produced every year by the Minerals Education Coalition. They do these um, statistics about how much every quote unquote average American needs of these different things like lead and coal and bauxite and zinc and iron ore and copper and cement in order to live their life. So, so this, this says every American born will need, and then in 2018 it was three, 0.03 million pounds of minerals, metals, and fuels in their lifetime to kind of underscore this idea that we're all dependent on the work that these people do. Um, if you've ever been to Colorado, there's a, the National Mining Museum and Hall of Fame is in Leadville up in the mountains. And they have one whole floor dedicated to this. They've recreated a house. And at every point in the house, they point out where the mining is. So this one is showing you what you need in order to have a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, this, they're taking kind of consumer products, and then on the side they show everything that mining puts into it. And then the most hilarious part of the exhibit is the bathroom, in which they show you all of the ways in which this daily multi-time activity depends on mining, right? So they're kind of trying to go into the very intimate parts of your everyday life, from the bathroom kind of to the, the toothpaste that you use. What's important to remember is that companies also engage in this sort of rhetoric. Um, so I have 15 years worth of corporate social responsibility reports, mostly focused on the coal industry, because that was the, the first industry that I studied. Um, so this is just a short sampling of them. But you can see that the imagery is a lot of mine employees kind of marked with their hard hats out in nature. Um, there's also a part of this genre in which kind of they show stereotypical like American Western things coexisting with mining. So here we have a cowboy with coal silos in the background. Um, up here, those are elk um, with that equipment in the background. And then that last one over there is some cattle um, on some coal mine property. Every time I walked into one of these sites, there's big pictures of kind of the wildlife uh, that surrounds the place. And so the question is, what's happening here, right? It's really significant if it's everywhere. And it deserves thinking about. Um, and I think some of it can be illustrated by one of the experiences that I had um, touring a really controversial mine in the Pacific Northwest. Um, what was really interesting about the tour is that I was able to go both with their head environmental engineer as well as with the head of the grassroots environmental organization that had actually stopped the mine from opening in the first place as an open pit mine uh, because he was able to galvanize so much opposition to the project. That company left. Another one came in and proposed an underground mine that he couldn't stop. But he managed to negotiate for rights to go on site and inspect um, and be kind of included in the decision making. 
And so as I was touring this mine um, here, it's kind of in this beautiful part of the Northwest kind of national forest area, we heard this bird call. And so the leader of the environmental group, he immediately right, pointed out which bird it was. And then we walked a little bit more, and then we heard the next bird call. And the environmental engineer kind of dressed in this plaid shirt and jeans and, and steel-toed hiking boots that made him look like he was a hiker, immediately popped up and said, oh, that one was this one. And so then these two men started this back and forth about who could identify more bird calls, right? And so they're trying to establish their own authority, their own experience as it relates to loving the outdoors, right? Not directly related to mining, but kind of appreciating the outdoors. And so I think the other crucial part of this is about how the specificity of the engineers become visible in these sorts of circumstances. So that was an environmental engineer kind of going in that tit for tat. Um, the, the same engineer that I told the story of how he loved backcountry skiing, he told me about when he was working in Alaska. He spent a lot of time backcountry skiing, and he noticed that there was this warming hut that was falling apart. Um, so warming huts are these really crude, kind of really just a hut, but where you can go in in case there's a storm, there's no running water. You could be there um, in case things got really sketchy and you can spend the night there if you're really kind of going all out. And he wanted to fix it. And what he did was he applied for funding from the oil and gas company he worked for to fix it. They approved his request. They also approved all of his time off, all of his colleagues' time off, to go do this project. But then in return, the company took their photos and created a full page ad that they took out in all of the major newspapers in Alaska that showed him and his friends kind of by this um, refurbished hut. And then it specifically showed their job titles at the bottom, right? Production engineer, reservoir engineer, um, as an example of the company's overall environmental responsibility. Um, so I think what's happening um, are two things. So the first thing is that it provides a frame, like a, a larger ethical frame for the engineer's work, um, that they're not just technical experts, that they're people with an environmental conscience. Um, and secondly, I think it sends this message that engineers in their roles as enactors of companies are making judicious decisions about which parts of the natural world should become resources. Right? So it's kind of sending the message that it's not just engineers who are human calculators trained to protect the financial bottom line at all costs, who are willing to go in and destroy mountains in order to produce gold. Instead, it sends the image that these are engineers who love the environment and they appreciate the beauty of a mountain and the tranquility of a stream and that they would not be proposing or participating in resource extraction unless it met their own standards, unless they thought it was a reasonable and ethically defensible thing to be doing. So social scientists would point out that this judicious decision-making image that's being promoted by companies, by trade groups, um, is more questionable in the role that it gives to other people, non-engineers, to participate in that decision-making about which sorts of natural resources, which sorts of parts of the natural world should become resources. You know, they don't just exist out in the world. Um, so there's lots of people, for example, in Colorado who are trying to stop resource production entirely, right? So they're opposed to fracking, both because of the social and environmental risks that it pose to the communities that host this. I mean, these rigs and these wells are literally in people's backyards. Um, but there's also people who argue that we should be asking more fundamental questions about resources than just how to produce more of them, right? So should we be thinking about ways to conserve um, oil instead of just producing more oil? So the anthropologist Laura Nader, um, she is sister to Ralph Nader. You might notice some family resemblance there. 
Maybe you're too young to know who Ralph Nader is. I, I, I always forget that I'm getting old. Um, anthropologists have noticed kind of similar attitudes and defenses from studying the oil industry, especially. And, and what they argue is that this response, right, that you all need oil, is an example of what Laura Nader calls an ideology of inevitability. And so Laura Nader came up with this term while she was on a US Atomic Energy Commission in the United States back in the 1970s. And she was an anthropologist surrounded by all of these physicists. And she was really intrigued at which questions weren't getting asked, right? So the 1970s in the US, we're in the midst of energy crises, right? The price of oil is going through the roof. And all the physicists wanted to talk about was more, more, more energy, right? And she said, wait, 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 why should we assume that we're always going to need more of it? What if instead we had national policies that encouraged energy conservation, right, instead of just trying to get more and more energy sources? And so she said that there's this ideology of inevitability, that we're always going to need so many more resources um, that we should critique because it forecloses other questions, um, especially about change and, and conservation. And, and some of the engineers I interviewed acknowledged kind of some of the truth to that perspective. Um, and and they, they were troubled by some of the lack of critical questioning as well. Um, does anybody know what city this is? This is Houston. So it's, it's kind of the, the US capital of, of oil and gas production. Um, what do you notice about the cityscape of Houston? Right, highways everywhere. If you've been to Texas, I mean, just the amount of, of concrete is amazing. I'm from this tiny town in Wyoming, right? We have two lane roads. This is kind of outside of my realm of expertise. And so, this person I'm going to share with you his story. He was also a geological engineer. He'd grown up in Utah. He described his childhood as being really countercultural. Um, as a teenager, he really enjoyed climbing. Um, he went into geological engineering again because he wanted to spend a lot of time outside. Showed up to career day at Mines, kind of that picture that I showed you at the beginning. The only people hiring are oil and gas companies. And so he accepts one because he has student loans, and he thinks he can be a force of change from the inside. Um, but he really wrestles with it. And, and so he encouraged um, us to think about a distinction between what he called little r responsibility and big r responsibility. So for him, little r responsibility is checking all of the boxes, making sure that you're following all of the law, you're kind of minimizing risks. Kind of, you're, you're doing everything you can to make things as safe and socially acceptable as possible. And he said that was OK, and that made him feel like he could go to sleep at night. But the thing that kept him up was the fact that he lived in this city in which he was utterly dependent on a car, um, that it was extremely difficult to ride a bike. People were hostile to carpooling. And he said, I am like working in this industry that has played a role in how we plan our cities, right? And why our cities are planned around all of these monster highways and parking lots instead of having public transportation available. And so he said, there's only so many micro excuses you can make to yourself until you find it impossible to reconcile how you're living with what it is that you're doing. Um, so he eventually left industry entirely. He went to get a fellowship working for Engineers Without Borders in Central America, um, and has since gone back to school. Um, but what he was lacking in his workspace was an opportunity to ask really big questions like that. I mean, he was really, he tried to get people riled up, and he'd show up to the break room, um, and he'd be having an anti-fracking kind of book um, you know, in the middle of this oil and gas company. And, he said people were like, oh, what is that? And they were kind of like interested and they wanted to understand, you know, what are these terrible things that people are saying about our industry? But then the second kind of you got into should we have oil production at these levels at all, he said that was taboo. Kind of people just shut down and, and he wasn't able to do that. And, and that's what he really valued. Um, so he left. 
So to me, um, his experience and others then raises the questions about how engineers can learn to listen and value others' perspectives. Um, and this is where my work with the Humanitarian Engineering Program at Mines um, has really flourished. Um, so I spend a lot of time co-teaching with engineering faculty um, to integrate critical approaches to social responsibility into their classes. Um, and one of the things that I've done is I've taken some of my favorite engineers from my research and I've used them as examples to try to integrate back into the curriculum. Um, so this is a petroleum engineer who I admire a lot. Um, he saw the fracking controversies happening and whereas the rest of the industry kind of had this knee jerk, let's just go educate people about the facts of fracking and everyone will agree with us perspective. He said, wait, this is not a problem of people not understanding engineering. This is a problem of us not understanding why people are opposed to our industry. And so he really focused his outreach on listening to people instead of just lecturing at them, which is very unique. Um, and so I've tried to work with our faculty to provide similar sorts of opportunities for our students. Um, so all of the engineering students at Mines, um, they do something called a field session in which they actually go out um, for class credit um, in the summers to the places where they're going to be working. Um, and so this is the petroleum engineering field session on the left in California. Um, and my postdoc on this project went along with all of those students and every time they were on site, she was helping them ask questions about social responsibility and so they were listening kind of firsthand about how these people actually in industry, in the workplace, thought about it. Um, that's not always possible. We can't fly to these places all of the time. So in terms of work at school, um, we've tried to set up community meetings. Um, so if I go back, this is, um, this engineer created these really interesting spaces in which um, his company and their contractors would kind of go to a public place in a town where they're gonna do oil and gas extraction and then set up tables. Each of the tables was dedicated to some particular concern so that they could staff that with experts from the company to answer questions. Um, and so we did that with our students and I brought in some of my favorite interviewees who had done this kind of over, over their careers to judge them. Um, they pretended to be stakeholders who were like opposed to fracking and then they put all of these students kind of on their toes um, to think about how they might explain their work um, in ways that other people would understand um, but only after they'd listened to what their real concern was, right? Instead of just shooting a bunch of data at them. Um, and I think this work is really important um, because I've met lots of engineers who are very thoughtful people and for some reason or another, they become interested in resource um, production in particular. Um, but when they find that those spaces don't accommodate their own ethics, they leave, right? And it's precisely these people that we want working um, inside of industry. So this is um, a woman who got a degree in civil and environmental engineering, and she'd always had a dream of working at this mine, which was close to where um, she grew up. And she graduated from college, and she got the job, and then she's kind of inside the belly of the beast, and she's really offended at all of her coworkers and how they're laughing kind of at some of the concerns that community members had about mining and she starts questioning the whole system of knowledge production in their face. Like, like, why is it that engineers are the only ones who have all of this technical training? And it's really difficult, right, for people to even participate in these sorts of debates because they don't have access to the same sort of education. And so she left. Um, she became a, a scholar, um, so she teaches, which is pretty great. I think that's a noble profession. Um, but she left industry because she couldn't find her own space um, to do it inside of it. So that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions, both specifically about what's happening there, but also maybe about anthropology in general. So thank you very much. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you so much. That's good. 
So I, I, I think my question is, I was really um, interested in that question between like the big R and the little r, discoverability, yeah. um, in terms of how it ex helps to explain like a discourse gap between these two populations, like when they come together to speak. Yeah. So if you think about the difference between like an environmentally conscious engineer versus uh, like a, an activist, an environmentalist, right, or someone who is bought into like the premises of something like deep ecology, like that the earth has value in and of itself, and that it's it has value which is separate from you know how what it can be extracted and used mm -hmm. as. So it just seemed like if you, I was wondering if you had in your research encountered any places where. Uh, you, you form some insight into those types of clashes, like between like the environmentalists and the value that they possess, and how difficult it becomes to then talk to, you know, even environmentalist engineers and with the values that they possess. That's a great question. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase it so so that they can hear it. Um, so the question was about expanding on the distinction between big R responsibility kind of acknowledging that the earth and kind of earth systems have intrinsic value kind of beyond whatever financial value we can create from them by extracting them. Um, and then the little r responsibility and that this, I think you're, you're exactly right, helps to explain the clashes, right, between even environmentally conscious engineers and then activists, right, because they're starting from two different definitions of what responsibility is. And, and I think that's exactly right. Um, and the way that I've been thinking about it um, is that there is a deep-seated pride in engineers being pragmatic, um, that we are going to solve these very immediate problems that are posed to us. And it would be great to kind of theorize about like, what a world without oil would look like. But in the meantime, like everybody has these cars, and everybody has these highways, and everybody wants to fly. And so there's, there's kind of this dedication to the pragmatic parts of this world that they work in, um, where, where they're investing a lot of their energy. Um, so, and, and, I, and there's a lot of truth to that, right? I mean, so I'm an anthropologist, and anthropologists love to imagine kind of radically different worlds. but we don't really have good answers for how we get there in a really concrete way, and that drives people like the kind that I interviewed up the wall, right? So there's this apocryphal image of an anti-industry environmentalist, right, who's out there protesting, and then he drives his SUV up to Vail, right, to go skiing, and so he's dependent on the very thing that he's protesting. So for me, kind of the, the space in which there's been more of the big R responsibility questions inside of industry is if there are places in which extractive activities shouldn't occur at all. So not that we're going to mitigate it, not that we're going to try to make it safe, but just we're not going to do it, period. And that does happen. Um, and so, but I think in order to really make things sustainable, that, that sort of question would have to be much bigger. I hope that helped. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. What would you describe as the utopian society like, of all these topics? Oh my, a utopian society. <laughs> I, I, I wonder, I mean, I don't know, me personally. I, I think for a lot of the people that I interviewed, like, they want a world in which we can have all of our comfortable consumer demands, right? We can run the air conditioning as long as we want to. We can all get a new phone every couple of years. We can fly, kind of, but at the same time that that's not causing extreme social and environmental harm to some people. Because for me, the justice question is that the energy that we all depend on and the minerals that we all depend on, they're very concentrated where they come from, right? So I grew up in this coal town that produces about 40% of all of the coal that gets burned in the United States. And at one point, when a lot of our energy was coming from coal, that was like 450 million tons of coal a year. 
And lots of people benefited from that electricity, but we were the ones, right, who were working out there, and we were the ones, right, who had our land changed, and we were the ones who had the boomtown phenomenon. So in, in my own idealistic world, it would be a more just place, right, in which the burdens would be more equally shared along with the harms. But that might make me sound like a communist, so. <laughs> Yes. Um, lots of questions, but um, I'm curious to know about uh, at School of Mines how uh, industry and academia interact. So I have an organic geochemistry background, and okay. always at conferences we would have you know academics who are studying the carbon cycle and climate change, and industry people who are studying how to find oil, you know things like yep. that. So um, are are there people at School of Mines who are focusing on safer mining practices, like, I don't know, alternatives to mountaintop removal mining, and how do they interface with industry, and how, how does that there? That's a great question. Um, so the question is about this relationship between academia and industry, um, especially given, um, I think maybe I'll add just funding differentials, right? So there's lots of money that comes from industry, but then that also constrains what kinds of questions you can ask, what kind of research you can do. Um, when I did my job talk at the Colorado School of Mines seven years ago, I was giving a talk critical of corporate social responsibility, and I walked into it in our brand new petroleum engineering building under the logo of Halliburton, um, kind of in just full color. It wasn't even just a plaque saying, right, that this was donated by Halliburton. It was a full color logo. Um, so the school, I mean, I don't, there are other people who probably have different opinions. My own personal experience is that there are lots of people who are very comfortable kind of working inside of industry and inside the parameters of the kinds of questions that they're asking. But there's also a lot of people and a lot of students who want to ask different questions and do different sort of things, right? So we have a huge, wonderful hydrology program that includes a lot of geochemists, um, geologists, environmental engineers, um, and many of them are very critical um, of, of industry, but those kind of two dimensions don't always sit well together. Um, in our own work, we've also been pragmatic um, in trying to find some spaces of overlap. So in the, both the mining and oil and gas industries, there have been a lot of hand-wringing over social acceptance um, because Communities and groups are increasingly able to stop that sort of activity. So there's been a lot of language of the social license to operate. Um, and that if you don't have community acceptance, then you don't have industry activity. And so we've tried to use that as an opening to think about ways to have more meaningful social engagement um, in, in those parts of industry. alternatives are there for people in this type of engineering world if they don't want to work for a big mining firm? See, it's really difficult. Um, so if I go, th I, I would say 35% of my interviewees had left corporate work um, or they hadn't sought it out in the first place. Of those, the majority founded their own consulting firms. And so as consultants, if they can get enough business, they can be very choosy about who they accept contracts with, right? And so the, the engineer I quoted you who wants to make sure his land looks good um, for hikers, he's a consultant and he saw firsthand like when he was working in um, Central Asia that a lot of Chinese companies were coming in and they were bringing a third more workers than they required because they just assumed a third of them would die or be injured. And so they didn't want to waste time like transporting. Let's just bring extra. 
And, and they would bring in, I mean, the most expensive part of a lot of these operations are the big engines. And they would just bring in a whole new many thousands of dollar engine from the beginning because they would assume one would break down because they weren't putting in the time for safety and maintenance. And so for him and then for other people, if they were consultants, they could choose the contracts with people that they respected and projects that they respected and that they thought they were going to be doing the right thing. Um, so they had more professional autonomy, which is a very serious question for engineers. Um, but at the same time, there was also some alienation because they were in this structural position of just recommending courses of action, right? So if you're working for a company, you have more decision-making authority. But as a consultant, you kind of provide a recommendation that the company can take or leave. So there was kind of a, a pro and a con to that. Um, for the people who didn't become consultants, they went into academia and are currently looking for other things to do. But I think the other part of your question that's really interesting is that there's a knowledge imbalance, right? Because so many people who have mining engineering or petroleum engineering backgrounds, they go to work for industry. That expertise is less prevalent in kind of um, NGOs or community organizations, right? So there's always this imbalance negotiating. So that mine in the Northwest that I showed you the picture of, one of the reasons which they're able to be successful is that they have a settlement, they've, they've gotten a lot of money, and they can hire their own engineer who's willing to kind of read whatever the company produces and critique it in their own language. But that's pretty rare. I'm also from Wyoming. You can ask me questions about Wyoming. It's a, it's a very exotic place. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe there's no interest. Yeah. I think climate change um, is maybe the biggest topic, right? Even in these industries. And so some of them, what's been really interesting for me to watch is how the mining industry rebrands itself. Um, so I don't have in this slide deck, but um, there's a few copper companies and rare earth um, material companies that are hinging their bets on our requirements of mining for even renewable energy technologies. Because if you think about renewable energy and you think about batteries, you think about wind turbines, you think about solar panels, like these things all still require mining. And so there's been this rebranding that mining is necessary for our energy transition, um, but not all mining, right? So coal has kind of been turned into the black sheep of the family, right? That people are going to disown because of its carbon footprint. And I have to suspect that the reason I found so many super reflective geologists is because they were thinking in that kind of deep time, right? And, and big kinds of environmental transitions instead of more, more narrowly. Yeah. I'm being videoed. <laughs> um, if, if coal mining and oil production were temporary. Um, so <laughs> I think, so I follow the coal industry a lot, right? Because that's where I'm, I'm from. Uh, that's where my dad worked. That's where I worked. Um, and it's just astounding to see the projections. And it's almost a total drop off. Um, and it matters which kind of coal you're talking about, because we'll probably still need coking coal, right, to keep having steel. But a lot of the coal that is mined in Wyoming is really low quality um, in terms of heat content. The reason why it's mined is because it's really low in sulfur and we have all the clean air regulations. Um, so when I look at coal projections, there's a big drop off, but a not total evaporation. 
um, because there will probably be some need for coal for other purposes. Um, it's also unclear how much energy transition is going to happen in other places. So a lot of the coal industry effort has been to try to export coal to other parts of the world, but increasingly those places don't want it either. Um, and in terms of oil, that seems much more unlikely because of how much we require in terms of plastics um, and, and petrochemicals. So I, I have a hard time seeing a future without those things, but it will probably look really different. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes? Another one. Um, the climate change question, do you think this was, are mining companies looking into carbon sequestration research as part of their practices to kind of offset their footprint? Yes. So the question was whether mining companies are looking at carbon capture and um, sequestration. Um, and the entire state of Wyoming is placing all of their eggs in that basket. Um, so there's a very stubborn refusal to diversify, um, even given everything that's happening. And so the state, as well as private industry, are kind of investing all of their money in carbon capture and storage um, as a way to try to remain relevant. I honestly, I don't know. We can all thank Dr. All right, thank you. Thank you.